in a, in a few few moments uh, as I set this uh, this time up. Um, and I, I, you know, just so that we're, I'm trying to just prime your brain. Think of a transformative event in your life. Uh, you know, maybe it was a, an actual event, maybe it's been some music, maybe it was a book, maybe it's some theater, maybe it's a song, music, maybe it's art of other sorts, but something, an experience that you had that you would think of as transformative, okay? Um, just give you a moment. It doesn't have to be dramatic. It could be a major one or a mini one. Um, So anyway, thinking of something transformative, and at most, I think we will have a handful of major transformative events in our life, right? Uh, if we're lucky, we'll have a bunch of mini ones. Um, my most recent mini transformational event, I realize I haven't got the book with me here, is the book, uh, Reading a Book, The Overstory by Richard Powers. It won the Pulitzer Prize, and uh, here's one comment about it. The Overstory, a novel about trees, which I love, this is why my daughter gave it to me. And the people who understand them is the eco epic of the year and perhaps decade. Unlike the Lorax who speaks for the trees, Richard Powers prefers to let them do their own talking. So this novel can transform not only the way you see trees, but how we can be shaped by them. Now, of course, that might sound a little woo -woo to you, but um, I think Whatever transformational event has come to mind, I think one of the things about them is that they transform our imagination. And really our imaginations are one of the most powerful things in the world. But um, so this Sunday is in the lectionary, we've already been introduced to it, is this Transfiguration Sunday, it's called. We're gonna read Mark's account in a minute, but basically where Jesus is on a high mountain and um, with three of his disciples, and Jesus is enveloped by a cloud. He turns shiny bright. God speaks. Old time, Old Testament heroes show up, and then poof, it's back to Jesus only. You know, that's a kind of a what I call a woo hoo kind of event. And in fact, there's lots of those what I would call dramatic transfiguration moments in the other readings, which we aren't reading. But let me just point them out. The Old Testament reading is from 2 Kings chapter 2, and it's about the prophet Elijah, one of these heavy-duty guys, uh, being taken up to heaven in chariots of fire, real chariots of fire, not the movie, okay? Um, then Psalm 50, uh, which is the reading from the psalm, has a dramatic picture, which is always when God shows up, this picture of God as judge, as a devouring fire, a mighty tempest, another one of those kind of strange woohoo kind of things. And then the New Testament reading out of 2 Corinthians talks about the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, this really powerful, bright, heavy kind of experience. But it says that is being veiled from people. So lots of these woohoo, transformational, trans transfiguration kind of style feeling of events in our scripture readings today. So when you say transfiguration, they say transfiguration. Deb said transfiguration, many others have said it. I'm gonna say transformation because it's a bit like you say tomato, I say tomato. Um, if we let it, here's, the, here's my thesis. If we let this transfiguration story work in our imaginations, this 2000 year old event, uh, it can transform continue to transform not only how we see Jesus, but also how we experience this world. I'll say that one more time and then get Len to read the, the real story for you. You say transfiguration, I say transformation. And if we give this transfiguration story permission to sort of transform our imaginations, it allows us to be transformed in how we see Jesus and how we experience the world and our life. Okay, Len, with that intro, take it away. Okay, can everybody hear me? Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up 
a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed him. And from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly they looked around. They saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Lynn. Well, I warned you, right? It's a bit of a woohoo kind of story. Um, and but for a Jew, I think for us who have, you know, varying degrees of knowledge of their background, but for a Jew with a mo modest knowledge of the Old Testament as we talk about it, it wouldn't be so woohoo because they knew that clouds and God were kind of, and God speaking from clouds was kind of thing. For example, Exodus 24, verse 15 goes like this. You'll notice the same characters. Moses went up to a mountain. Here we have a mountain. And the cloud, cloud, covered the mountain, and God called, right, to Moses out of the cloud. The cloud, also a sign of God's presence in the wilderness wanderings of the people of Israel. So for God, for God to show up for the, the sort of literate Jew, there will be clouds. Um, that's why Vancouver is such, such a holy, special place. But enough of that. Also, these two heavyweights would be familiar to them. Moses, traditionally associated with the first five books of the what we call the Old Testament, the law, the Torah. And uh, by the way, interesting footnote, Moses, a murderer, was used by God to do significant things. That's an interesting little story for another time. Anyway, there's Moses, heavyweight, and then Elijah. He's this heavy-duty prophet. He's the real chariots of fire guy. He's taken up to heaven in chariots of fire. And who, Jews in Jesus' day, the, those who were looking for, you know, the Messiah, expected Elijah to show up before the Messiah, okay? So talk about the transfiguration for a knowledgeable Jew. It's an A-list event. There's some A-list symbols. There's some A-list personalities. But if you're like me, which is maybe not a good thing, but you might say, so what? Or all caps, so what? It's just, just another one of those strange biblical stories that have nothing to do with me, nothing to do this with us. Or could this be an invitation to let this story transform our imagination so that we are transformed and we get continue to be transformed in how we see Jesus and how we experience our life. Because that's what was starting to happen to those disciples. I mean, put yourself in their shoes, or I guess we should say in their sandals. Ha, ha, ha. But, you know, if I was one of them, you might, uh, I might say something like this. Um, you know, we've been following this guy. He's doing amazing things. He, he speaks very powerfully with an authority we haven't really seen. Uh, we're having amazing experiences. But, um, you know, the Romans, they're a brutal colonial occupying power. And uh, they don't like social unrest. And, um, and of course, um, the religious establishment, they're kind of threatened by things getting a little out of hand. So I'm wondering if I've signed up for something that's a little little too much for me. And, and of course, he's now talking about dying. And uh, uh, But then there were those words that we heard about, like, you know, that uh, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. And could this could this Jesus who we're intrigued by be, oh, I don't even want to say it, could be more than what we think, could be more than, you know, could actually be God, right? 
And I think that sense, you know, all of us come to, to that, that place, right? Not just once, but ongoing. We, we have this choice to let our view of who Jesus is be transformed. Um, you know, is Jesus a good guy? He's doing good stuff. He's a great, powerful teacher. He embodies a great ethic, uh, the model of sacrifice for others. Or could he be all that and something more? You know, that's, we all of us struggle with that. Could he be, nah, you don't even want to say it, could he be God, right? That's the woo-hoo kind of moment. And by the way, um, Darcy, when you were talking about literalism, I mean, uh, our, our Muslim friends view, view the, the uh, Quran very much as, you know, written by the finger of God too, but they have a good critique, a valid critique of this Christian talk of Jesus as the son of God. And I think, uh, crassly put, their question is in effect something like this. So who, you calling Jesus the son? Okay, so who is God having sex with to have a son? And of course, the wrong answer is Mary. And I think what we have to understand when the Bible says the son, it's saying the son is actually of the same essence as God. Whatever it goes into making the God stuff of God, that's what Jesus has. And to, to talk about that, we use the word son. Anyway, anyway, this journey that we're all of us on in various degrees, journey on the way, on the open way, is about choosing to do an experiment. And this it's a one-time experiment. And the experiment is this, to live as if what Jesus said about himself is true. That he was all those good things, but that he was also, you know, uh, I don't know, I 100% believe, but he was also God. Um, we're going to enter the experiment. So if you want to, you want, we're going to enter the matrix and we're going to see how things go. And I think if we do this, if we take this adventure, we discover it not only continues to transform our view of who Jesus is, but it transforms how we experience life. Uh, and that's a wild claim. But if, G if what Jesus said is true, you know, and if he was raised from the dead and is alive and is leading us into our good futures, we should expect to sort of experience Jesus enmeshed in our ordinary lives. Um, and I'm just going to give you a very down to earth example of uh, in our lives as a family. Um, 12 years ago, as a family, we were considering going to India to volunteer as teachers at an international school. We were praying about it, wondering whether to go, or in the language of this sermon that I'm preaching, we were choosing to enter the experiment. We were choosing to enter the matrix and live as if, you know, Jesus was who Jesus said he was and was alive and leading us. And we should expect some engagement in our lives, right? So we went to just a potluck gathering of people with some connection to that part of the world, Southeast Asia. And at that gathering was a family who'd gone to that part of the world. They knew nothing about what we were thinking about. And they'd gone to that part of the world with their children. Interesting. They'd gone to that world with their children who were roughly our children's ages when they'd gone. Our children were going to go into grade 10, grade 8, and grade 4. And they really encouraged us, you know, to go. Now, you might say, okay, was that coincidence? The safe answer is yes, of course it was coincidence. It just happened. Or was that Jesus, in a very ordinary way, non-woo-hoo, in a sense, saying to us, you've been thinking about this thing. I'm, I'm engaged in your life. What more do you want? It looks like it would be a good thing for you to do. It's going to be hard, but it'll be good. What do you think? That's what stuff I'm talking about. You choose to do the experiment, enter the matrix. And so as we come into this season of Lent, this time before Easter, people do all kinds of things during Lent, you know, submerge themselves in ice cold baths and chant psalms and do all kinds of, you know, they, you know, they maybe give up things like chocolate or alcohol or boy, if you're really serious, Netflix or, or add something like doing a real Sabbath, like stopping what you normally do, or maybe reading scripture each day to become more, you know, more spiritually attuned so that you can enter into this Lenten journey uh, in some way. Um, here's a Lenten practice suggestion for you. Do this very simple experiment. 
You wake up each day, take a deep breath as Sonia was leading in, paying attention to our breathing, very important. And uh, say, hello, Jesus, or words to that effect. I know that sounds a bit woo-hoo, but that's actually how we choose to enter, do this experiment, to enter the matrix. Uh, choosing to live as if what Jesus said about himself is true, he's alive, he's present in our world, and he's calling us in very ordinary, practical ways into our good future. So, then, just pay attention to what happens in your day. What nudges do you get? What conversations do you have? You say, oh, wasn't interesting we had that conversation. Or what words do you hear? Um, you know, what coincidences do you notice? You just stay awake. All that kind of stuff. And I think you will discover uh, that who you think Jesus is and how you experience the world will be transformed. So let me just spell out this Lenten practice. This is my, uh, you know, we don't have a big grand Lenten practice. Two things. First, why don't you just listen to scripture someone? Go to a site like uh, Bible Gateway. You can have some semi-famous or famous person read you. You might say, okay, during Lent, the next 40 days, I'll just read through a gospel. I'll get someone to read it to me. It'll take maybe three minutes. You go there, you can choose who's going to read it to you. You listen to it. Then at the end of it, take a deep breath and say, and say, hello, Jesus. <laughs> then pay attention. Just be mindful about how your day goes. You say transfiguration. They say transfiguration. I say transformation. You know, the open way mantra is belong, enjoy, transform. And, uh, and I think just let's give ourselves permission to do this, let this transfiguration story transform our imaginations. And we, I think, will actually start to experience Jesus differently and our lives a little more differently as we go through it. So... Glory be to God, as we traditionally name God the Father. Glory be to God the Son, uh, the one who's of the same God stuff as God, and God the Holy Spirit, who enables all this belong and joy transformation stuff and makes this experiment worthwhile. <laughs> as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. And now open way, typically just take a little bit of silence to see, give the Holy Spirit some space to rattle around.